How are you today? Staying dry? This is like weather from when I was a little kid in McMinnville, isn't it? It's like really rainy. I was driving uh, yesterday on Garden Valley, and I saw old Noah building that another ark, you know, just in case. So, uh, hey, turn to your neighbor and say, stop complaining. We need the ring. <laughs> hey, we're, we're hanging out in Ephesus this summer, uh, studying an amazing letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians living in this really fascinating ancient city. Uh, in the in the uh, Roman Empire, and I want to invite you to take out those message notes uh, and open up those Bibles, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. Today, we're going to read the first 14 verses, and we're going to land in a few pa- places and just work through it together. I'm parsing out our passage today into three sections. It's there on your notes. First, we're going to just do a little bit of a bio on the Apostle Paul. I'm going to talk for literally one or two sentences on what first century greetings are like in, in these letters. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time on this huge run-on sentence that Paul writes. It's not a run-on sentence in our English translations. They have mercy on us. Uh, But in the Greek, it's just one big sentence because Paul was just galloping here. And we're going to see that it's very dense. Okay, so here we go, guys. Verse 1, Ephesians 1. Paul. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, (laughs) It's really helpful to know that Paul is the author of this letter, especially if you're new to the Bible. Uh, you're going to see the name Paul and the person Paul pop up quite a bit, guys, because he writes significantly in our New Testaments. But it's helpful to know that Paul was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, he didn't have Christian parents. Uh, he did not have Christian grandparents. He did not go to summer camp. He did not go to Bible camp. He did not ever sing as a kid, Jesus loves me, this I know, because Paul, quite frankly, hadn't written that yet in the Bible. Um, quite the opposite. In fact, he became one of Christianity's start, uh, uh, fiercest opponents when the Christian movement was just very young in the first century there. And so um, he, was, he was born right around the same time as Jesus. And so if you think about Jesus and how old Jesus is, if you're reading in the Gospels, Paul was right there, uh, not in the same area, but right there, uh, give or take a, a couple of years there. He was raised in South Turkey, uh, a city called Tarsus. It's South Turkey now. It wasn't Turkey then. Uh, and uh, it's not too far from Ephesus. And Paul was born a Roman citizen, which was kind of a big deal because it wasn't automatic that someone born in the Roman Empire was conferred citizenship. In fact, most people had to spend lots of money to purchase this and the benefits that it came with. But Paul was probably from a wealthy family. And so he was, he was born into his citizenship uh, his folks were devoutly Jewish. He was raised very Jewish, and they must have recognized little genius Paul uh, early on because they sent him to Israel's finest boarding school in Jerusalem where he received the best education a Jewish young man could receive. He learned the Old Testament. When I say he learned the Old Testament, I mean Paul like memorized the Old Testament. He learned Jewish law and theology and history and culture. He also studied Greek philosophy par excellence. He understood Epicureanism and Stoicism and these different factions of Greek thought. And he was just genius. He also had a side hustle. He drove for, for Uber or maybe it was Lyft. We're not sure. Uh, no, he learned a solid trade making tents. And his hometown, Tarsus, was kind of famous for this in the first century. Tarsus goat-haired tents. Black goat-haired tents were like the rage, all right? This was like Patagonia-level brand, right? You know what I'm talking about? It was high-end stuff. It was been like REI. It'd be like 1800 bucks for one of these things, you know? Right next to the ice axe handles, which we all need one of those, REI. Thank you very much. All right, so um, Paul mentions this. He learns this trade uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, one of his other uh, letters, he talks about learning this trade as a young man, as a wee lad. And tent making was, uh, was, was a mobile profession. And so he could just roll around the Roman Empire with a small like toolkit and set up in any city and make a living. And this is what he did. And so it's, it's really the whole package with Paul. He was brilliant. He was academic. He was uh, industrious. He memorized the Old Testament. He was a, a, a strong work ethic guy. And he was, he was a, a person of passionate, passionate faith in Yahweh. The cream always rises to the top. Say that to your, your neighbor. The cream rises to the top. Isn't this true? It's true with Paul. You know what I'm talking about? 
It's a metaphor. Some of you are looking at me. Uh, he became the party leader of a sect of Judaism called Phariseeism, which was a dominant, a dominant subgroup within within first century Judaism, and Paul sort of rose through the ranks. He passed up all his contemporaries, and he was really this leader, this brilliant thinker. And when Christianity began to spread like wildfire, Paul was there not to join it, but to stop it. He had this jacked up religious fervor. He thought he was working in alignment with God, but he became the guy who led the first killings of Christians. He was organizing like hunting parties, to stop, to stymie this Christian, this Christian denomination, as it were. He was waging a holy war, convinced he was doing Yahweh's work. As it turns out, if you read this in the book of Acts, on his way to kill more Christians in a different city, lo and behold, Jesus appears to him in a divine vision. And it literally knocks him off of his animal. And he hears this word, Paul from Jesus. Paul or Saul. It's the same name in different languages. A Hebrew Saul, Paul is in Greek. And in this moment, his entire world was dismantled. Jesus appears to Paul, and immediately he understands who God is. And Jesus doesn't reach out to punish Paul or to kill Paul. He, in fact, reaches out to save him. So then in this moment, his trajectory has changed. Maybe some of you resonate with Paul's story. Some of you met Jesus in a way that you weren't thinking of. You, He wasn't on your mind. And then all of a sudden, some way, some form, some fashion, God appears to you, Christ appears to you, and just knocks you off your horse. And all of a sudden, you're now headed in a completely different direction. Thank God, because, and maybe you can relate to Paul in that, because this is what happens here. And so now he's devoting his life to preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, to unpacking what the gospel is, to integrate the Old Testament truths about who God is and then, and then seeing them carried forth now in this new covenant under the gospel of Christ. But because of his background of murdering Christians, Paul would refer to himself in his letters as the, as the, um, as the, the greatest Jew of his generation, but also the least of the apostles. He's constantly saying how low he is how, how well, he's the least of, of the apostles. And so this brilliant, magnificent man of God, Paul, we see now in Ephesians, he's been a Christian about three decades, a little under. It's the winter of his life. It's AD 60, AD 61. He's located in a Roman prison. He's been locked up for his faith. Nero will eventually in a few years mar- uh, kill him. He will be martyred for his faith. He's awaiting trial. This man has given up anything and everything for Jesus. And while in jail, he has time. He has time. He can't move around. He can't, he can't freely move from church to church or city to city. And so he's stuck. And while he's stuck, the Lord puts on his heart, his old church that he used to pastor in Ephesus. And so he writes this letter to the brothers and sisters of his church, of his heart. To the saints, Paul says, who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right here, we we kind of pause for a moment and, and we just reflect that this is really first century letter writing standard format. This is a, what we call a greeting And if you study letters, not just in the New Testament, the epistles, but in extra biblical letters, you'll see that the way that first century letters were structured, this fits it classically. It told you, for example, who was writing from the very beginning, which I find very logical. The way that we get letters, if you even get a letter, right? Who gets a letter anymore? You get a snail mail letter and uh, we have to skip down to the bottom to find out who it's from. And then we have to go back up to the top to then start reading the content. Well, that's dumb. Isn't that dumb? That's so dumb. It's so illogical. The way we do letters is way dumber than the way they did letters. In fact, we, we, uh, we should take our cues and clues here because it's more logical. And then, and then it tells not only who it's from, but who it's, who it's for. And here we see that it's for the saints in Ephesus. Now, this literally means, means Christians. Saints in the New Testament doesn't mean super Christian. It just means Christian. So, uh, if you're a Christian, here in, in the room or online. Hi, everybody online. Uh, you're a saint. You're a saint. 
So turn to your neighbor and say, I don't know, are you a saint? I think you're a saint. Maybe you're a saint. Are you a Christian? You're a saint. Say their name. Saint, Saint, Saint Ronnie. Saint Ronnie, or what's person's name? Saint Kyle, Saint Alicia. Uh, there you go. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the Ephesians were faithfully following Jesus, and usually in these greetings there was some kindnesses expressed before we got into, you know, why is the letter being written? So let's read this next section, and I'm going to read, this is a dense passage from verse 3 through 14, but just kind of listen, follow along with me. Again, one long run-on sentence, not good grammar, Paul, but again, I think he's just caught up. I think he's just rolling. Sometimes you're on a roll, kind of like Steph Curry the other night, amen, yeah? I mean, he's just, he's just dropping threes, Paul is, from, from the cheap seats here. Here we go, verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. <sighs> wow. That's a lot, huh? Okay, uh, initial thoughts. What's, what stands out what we just read? One word, one thought. Anything? Predestined. Okay. Adopted. Ooh. Redemption. Purpose. Yeah. Very good. There's so much here, isn't there? There's more, right? Holy, blameless, in love, these things. I mean, it's just so much. This is like eating a piece of really rich cheesecake. It's just so dense or, or just, just a meal that's just high protein, delicious. You just kind of want to sit with it a little bit. Sit with it a little bit. By the way, in your, uh, in your notes, we're not going to get to all the fill-ins today, just to FYI. So I know some of you, this is going to make you sweat, but you will <laughs> just going to have to live with the fact that this week you're going to be unresolved. Let me start, let me start this way. The city of Ephesus, as we said last week, the people there were absolutely obsessed with spiritual things. They had over 50 temples to their gods and goddesses. They were very spiritual. They were very, uh, they were very devoted to their gods and goddesses. Picture now ancient Ephesus. And there's just people running around every day from temple to temple, uh, sacrificing, wearing themselves out, worshiping their gods, trying to make each of their, their gods happy, their goddesses happy. So how this worked was every realm of life had its commensurate god or goddess that in the spirit world, this is what they believed, controlled that area of life. And so your family life, your hunting life, your business life, your sex life, your, uh, your, 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 even your own business. If you were, if you were a metal, a metal guy, if you were a, a blacksmith, if you were, uh, if you, you had a vineyard, if you had a vineyard and you were a wine person, your God was Dionysus. That was, Dionysus was the God in the spirit realm, according to the Romans, that controlled your harvest and controlled how good your wine was. And so you needed to sacrifice to Dionysus if you wanted to have a decent year that year. By the way, if your name is Dennis, guess what? You're named after the God of wine, Dionysus. That's just a free one for you. So there you go. So they believed that, that happiness and success was all about pacifying 
these spiritual gods and goddesses who also, by the way, were really moody. They were moody and capricious. And they could just like all of a sudden be your best friend. And then like, I don't know, in middle school, then all of a sudden they hated you. And they're like, oh, bro, speak to the hand or whatever. This is what they were like. And so they were constantly trying to like make them happy. And if anything in this era of your life went south for you, that meant that your god or goddesses were where they weren't happy with you. And so you had to go to the temple and you had to make them happy. And you just you know, don't go do the thing. Go bring your worship kit. Go do your stuff. Go sacrifice. Go, go pay money. Go do these things. And so, so here was the thing. If you wanted to become wealthy, then it was your god or goddess who decided that. And so who was wealthy, who was poor, who was successful, who was popular, uh, who was healthy, all of that was determined behind the scenes. These blessings were doled out by the gods. So Roman bro, Roman sis, you better get busy and get your stuff done so that you can get a piece of the pie. Does that sound familiar at all? Maybe, just a little bit. Can you see that maybe today? Change some of the details. So here's what Paul is doing right off the bat here in this book. He's saying, guys, you don't have to chase Jesus around to get his blessings because Jesus is your blessing. Paul Paul spends zero time telling what, what these Christians, these in Ephesus, what they needed to do to receive the blessings of God. Instead, he tells them all about Jesus. And the, and the blessings Jesus just brings with him. So here's his main idea. The biggest, the most ultimate, the most complete, the greatest blessing in your life is Jesus. This is what we just read. Jesus is the most top-notch blessing in your life. It's the blessing of all blessings, and it's the blessing of which all other blessings are derived. It's Jesus. Here's what it says, again, in uh, verse 3 and then 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has blessed us in the beloved. That word beloved is capital B in your Bibles because this is a title for Jesus. You are blessed in the, in the beloved. In Jesus, you are blessed. In Jesus, you have your max blessing. All the other blessings in your life flow from the master blessing of Jesus Christ. He is the best, the best blessing, the biggest blessing you could possibly have. He says, you don't have to chase down this blessing of Jesus. In fact, like you're used to, in fact, this is the only blessing in the universe that's going to chase you down instead. And that's Jesus. Oh, that's good teaching. That is, Paul is teaching us such good gospel freeing reality of life. And so let's, let's, let's bounce off this. In your life right now, think about the blessings in your life. What are some blessings in your life? Maybe um, health, uh, maybe some, some provision. Maybe you, you filled your tank up with gas yesterday and you had enough, just barely enough to pay for it. That's a blessing. Oh man, that's like a dead walking miracle blessing right now, ain't it? 21 gallons in my truck yesterday, 133 bucks. They had to actually, you know, they have to like, the, the, the credit cards have a cap on it, right? And so the guys have to, the, the pump guys, by the way, you get your gas pumped here in Oregon. That's pretty neato. Um, they don't, you don't have to even do that. I don't know, except, I don't know. I, is that a good thing? Anyways, you put the credit card in and then it tops out at 125 and then you got to do it all over again. And it's like, hey, they have to knock on the window and you're, oh, okay. And yeah, anybody, anybody? Well, that's a blessing. Uh, <laughs> the blessing of marriage, the blessing of family, you know, your relatives, the blessing of friendships. So here it is. Don't ever let the love of your heart attach more to those things than, than the blessing of Jesus in your life, because then your heart's, your heart's disorganized. Be most passionate about the blessing of Jesus. Get the most geeked up about Jesus. Get the most excited about Christ in your life and the blessing of the gospel, the blessing of being loved and the blessing of grace and mercy, what we just read here, right? Here's the thing, though. Some of us, the thing in our lives that blesses us the most, the thing that we're most excited about, it wouldn't necessarily be Jesus, especially if we look at our socials. Because I think sometimes our our life, we get a little bit out of order. We get more excited about the blessings of stuff. 
don't we? Have you seen this? Maybe in your neighbor or somebody else. Yeah, maybe not yourself. Or we get like a really excited and blessed, like top-notch blessing about a promotion at work or, or, or some of us about how great our kids are. I watch your socials. Oh my goodness. Your kids are so awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much for telling us constantly how great they are. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Some of us have all the excitement in the world about the good things in our life except the blessing of Jesus. Super excited about that vacation. Super excited about, I don't know, hanging, you know, girls weekend, whatever. But Jesus, yeah, you know, that's not, yeah, he's, yeah, he's there. He's there. So, so here's the deal. Prioritize him in our hearts. Prioritize Jesus as your most sought after blessing. And all your other blessings, here it is, all your other blessings will be even more fulfilling. What do I mean? Take the, take the blessing of marriage. So some of you are married in here, uh, and marriage is a blessing, and you know, it can be. Uh, somebody said that marriage is the closest thing to heaven or the closest thing to hell on earth, friend. And I think that's kind of true. That's really a different sermon, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, we all want to, if you're married, you want to bless marriage. You want to work at that marriage. You want to prioritize your spouse, but you got to put time and effort. Here's the thing. Yes, all those things are true, what I just said. But the best way to have a blessed marriage is to love Jesus more than your spouse. Okay? Love Jesus more than your spouse. And then encourage your spouse to love Jesus more than your spouse loves you. This is the best way. Why is that? What, 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 what is that all about? Well, if you spend time with Jesus and you hang out with Jesus, then he changes you and he makes you a better spouse. He makes you more loving, more forgiving, more patient, more gentle, more kind, more joyful to be around. And so if you want to have a blessed marriage, then hang around Jesus and be around Jesus and love spending time with Jesus. And then you're going to be a better husband. You're going to be a better, you're going to be a better wife. Love Jesus, let me keep going, love Jesus more than you love your kids, which seems almost counterintuitive, but love Jesus more than you love your kids because when you hang around Jesus and he changes you, you're going to be more loving, more tender, more forgiving, more gentle, and more kind as a parent, and that's going to make you a better parent. It's going to make you have a better relationship with your kids so that when your kids are 28, they will leave your house and they will get a job and you can hang out and have fun. I don't know if it happens before 28, then you're doing great. Uh, love Jesus more than the blessing of your job. Your job is awesome, I'm sure. I'm glad you found what your calling is. But if you hang out with Jesus, you prioritize Jesus more than your job, then you're going to be a better colleague, a better boss, a better employee. Because why? You'll be more loving, more forgiving, more gentle, more patient, more joyful. Love the blessing of Jesus more than the blessing of your money. I'm glad that you have it all sorted out. Some of you have it all sorted out. I'm so happy for you. But guess what? You'll be a much better Christ follower because you'll be more generous, more effective, more satisfied, less complainy, and yes, for some of you, less jerkish if you allow Jesus to tenderize your heart. You'll be more joyful with your finances. So here it is. Prioritize Jesus as your most sought after blessing and all of your blessings beyond that will be more fulfilling, more life-giving because they're in the right order. This is what we read here in Paul's, Paul's letter. If you, if you're, if you're hearing me today, you're kind of like, yeah, this is convicting me a little bit. You know, I think maybe I have had some, some order, order disorder. Maybe there's, there's some things that have popped up into that first spot, and Jesus has moved down your list. Don't be condemned. Please don't be condemned here, because this is, this is, you're just, this is humanity. But this week, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, and ask him to take first place in your life. And whatever you need to do to deprioritize that thing that's taken top spot, do that. If that means you got to just kind of step away from it, get rid of it, it means if you, if not your marriage, okay, not your kids, uh, but you know what I'm saying? And, and make sure, prioritize, pray through that. Walk with the Lord. Ask the Lord to renovate your heart's desires 
Reorder your affections. Restore Jesus as your first love and top blessing. Okay, let me keep going because what we have next here is Paul, he's going to elaborate on the blessings that Jesus brings with him automatically to our lives. And what we find here is those blessings define us, these spiritual blessings. All right, so let's let's fill in a few now. The blessing of Jesus brings with it the fact that we are chosen before the foundation of the world. This is powerful. Look at verse 4. Here it is on the screen. That he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us. You're chosen. You're chosen. Not only you're chosen, but this happened before the foundation of the world. Uh, have you ever been like did you, on the playground? Maybe go back to when you were a kid and you're like, they're, they're picking teams. Like, you don't have to raise your hand, but who was like the last kid picked? Okay. Some of you are like, yeah, I was always the last kid. Some of you were like the first kid picked. And so you don't know what it's like to not be chosen. Doesn't it? To not be chosen. Or maybe think of it this way. You're like trying for a job and it's like maybe your dream job and you, you get like second place or you get third. That, that feeling that it's, you, they didn't choose you. That's no good, huh? Isn't that like, ah, how's that, isn't that, just, that doesn't make you feel good. Because it, 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 you sort of interpret it as like you're not good enough. You didn't make the cut. Well, guess what? With God, it's the opposite. He chose you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Before the world was created, God knew you. God knew about you, and he loved you. There's never, check this out. There's never been a time when God did not know about you and never been a time when he has not loved you. So let's think about this. How old is the uh, the universe? Do you know how old the universe is? <laughs> uh, that's a loaded question. I don't know. It's Let's just say it's pretty old. It's older than any of us. It's old. Now, but think about, go back to now the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the creation. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Remember those passages? God bringing about the cosmos. Uh, by the way, the word world here that Paul uses in the Greek is cosmos. So this is like, think bigger than planet Earth. This is like objective reality now. Before God brought about the cosmos, God was thinking about you. Before he ever said, let there be light, God was thinking about you. He chose you before that. This means you are not an accident. This means that you are not a byproduct of random molecules and beneficial mutations furthered along by natural selection, okay? You're here on purpose. You're here by design. And for as long as God has been in existence, he has cherished you and he has planned to redeem you because he has chosen you. Why did God choose me is the question that a lot of us ask. Why did he choose me? What was the reason why God chose me? Is it because God knew that you would make an awesome Christian? No. Did I pop some bubbles? Did I burst some bubbles in here? No, I know I didn't. This is a real realistic group in here. If you're brand new to Redeemers, we just do a lot of real talk about ourselves. Is it because that somehow you weren't quite as messed up as another person? Not really. Again, I follow your socials. You're really messed up, all right? <laughs> we all are. Me too. <laughs> Is it because you had a good heart? Yeah, I don't know. Not, not theologically. So here's the thing that the Bible teaches. It's none of these things. Because why? We're sinners. We're just, we're just born sinful. We're born selfish. We're born with this infectious like disease called sinfulness that's infiltrated every part of us. There's not one single part of us that has not been infiltrated by sinfulness. And you know, theologians call it total depravity. It's not that you're as bad as you could be. It's just that every part of you has been soaked in this thing called sin. And it's affecting the way that you live and the way that you are and the way that you interact with others. And so the Bible teaches all of these things. And so God didn't ever chose us because somehow, you know, we were just like slightly better in the, in the pool of humanity. No, not at all. It's the opposite. God chose us in spite of ourselves. He chose us because of his grace. That's it. 
It's all his grace. The unmerited favor. That's the choosing causal force of God. It's his grace. It's all his grace. It's all his choosing us based on the fact that none of us deserved it, but because he wanted you to be a Christian, he willed it, and so he chose you. That's the teaching. That's our theology. Along with this, Paul tells us that your second feeling, that we are predestined to adoption through his will. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself. And then in verse 11, Paul reiterates, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So this is similar to the first one. It kind of goes together, being chosen and being predestined. This means, what does this mean? This word, predestined, what does this mean? This means that God predetermined to call you his own in Jesus. That means, it means that God already went through the decision-making process about you a long time ago, and he decided to adopt you as one of his children. Have you ever, has anybody in here ever adopted? I've got a number of friends who've adopted It's interesting, the adoption process, because you get to choose the kid. You get to choose the kid, which is, you know, otherwise you just, you you don't get to choose. It's the kid pops out and it's your kid. Hey, you got to take care of this kid. That's it. Popped out. Sorry, mom. That's crass. (laughs) Okay. All right. Let me, let me pause because I know what some of you are thinking. Wait a minute, Billy. Wait just a minute. So you're saying, no, I'm not saying, the Bible is saying, the Bible is saying we are saved because God chose us and predetermined ahead of time who would be in Christ. Yes, this is what the scriptures teach us. So God chose me and predetermined me without my input Does not that violate my choice? No. Because the Bible, who said no? You did, you did great. You get a free donut. You get a free cup of coffee outside. The Bible says God's choice is never against our will, but always consistent with our will. Therefore, all who come to God freely choose to. Doesn't the Bible also say, though, Billy, that God loves all people and desires all people to be saved? Yes, that is what the scriptures teach us. And don't the scriptures also say, Billy, that whosoever desires to follow Jesus can come to him and be saved freely? Yes. My friends, this is what the Bible teaches as well. So how can the Bible teach that salvation is all God's choice and simultaneously also teach that I have a choice in the matter? I don't know. (laughs) I didn't write it. You know how the Bible can teach it? Because both are true, because both are revealed in Scripture. And we must hold these things in dynamic tension. We must hold them in dynamic tension, my friends. In God's word, you have to understand that there are things, some things, that boggle our minds. And we have to humble ourselves before them. Please understand me. I am not saying that the scriptures are illogical or irrational or that they contradict themselves. I am saying that just in certain places, we come across deep pools that may be beyond the grasp of our finite minds. And so we must take the Bible as God gives us the Bible. And in some places, we come across passages that teach us about the doctrine of predestination, that that salvation has everything to do with God's will and God's choosing And his perfect will is enacted upon the theater of humanity with no input from any of us because God is God and God is going to God. Ephesians 1 is a classic example of this, this theological construct and concept. But we also must acknowledge there's other places in Scripture that we come across that talk about our involvement, our desires, our, our making a choice, as it were, 
and that God doesn't force us to come to him. And so we have to wrestle with this. We have to kind of, we have to kind of, we have to be flexible with this. Some churches, though, take a hard stance on either side of this issue theologically for many, many years now, hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, Redeemer's Fellowship does not. Our church does not define itself in these terms, and I'm going to throw a couple terms out, Calvinistic terms. Calvinism is a, th- is a thing that maybe some of you are aware of, or Reformed theology. But nor does our church define itself as Arminian or Wesleyan in its approach to how salvation happens. I- I'm just teaching you the scriptures as we come across the scriptures, and some days I'm going to sound very Calvinistic, and some days I'm going to v- sound very Wesleyan, and-, and it's just depending on what we're reading. It's where we are in the scriptures. And so we don't let systems of theological thought label us or box us in. Uh, this is why, partly why, Redeemers is a non-denominational church. There's advantages to being a non-denominational church. And so this is one of them. We just believe what we, what's written in the Bible. And so I'm going to frustrate some of you. I know, I can see it in your faces right now. I love you, but I'm going to frustrate you. And please don't be mad at me. Please don't be frustrated at me. Please don't write me nasty emails. I love you. But I'm not going to be able to solve this for you. So there's a passage that helps put this into perspective. We're going to go to the Old Testament just for a moment. I'm going to read you this from Deuteronomy 29. Moses writes, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What a beautiful passage. If you're, if you're a student of church history, John Calvin, this was one of his favorite passages. Now, John Calvin in the 1500s was a Frenchman who came to Jesus and was radically born again, and France kicked him out, and Switzerland welcomed him in. <laughs> Switzerland, Switzerland. Switzerland. I mean, it's just, it's like a magnet for geniuses, you know. Yeah, uh, Germany kicked out Einstein. Guess where? Guess where he went? He went to he went to Bern, Switzerland, and wrote the theory of relativity in Switzerland. We're just like I don't know. It's just Switzerland. Oh, I mean, uh, if you ever watch Jeopardy, I'm an I'm an avid Je- at, by once a week on average. There's a Switzerland clue in there. Yes, there's only eight million of us, and we get it once a week on Jeopardy. Come on. Um, that's not what this is about. <laughs> Did you guys know I'm Swiss? I, I'm Swiss? Okay, all right. So back to this. What this means is, I know you guys are like, I hate Switzerland now. You ruined it for me, Billy. Uh, what this means is, is that there are things that God has revealed to us about himself, which we hang on. We hang on to it tight and we obey. We obey, we hang on, we, we let it get inside and... Uh, empower us. It's our protein. And then there are some secret things, secret things that God hasn't enabled us for whatever reason to see at this point, at this point. And so we're free to ask questions and we're free to, to wrestle with this. But we should never let those questions make us doubt who God is and his love for us or have us walk away from God out of frustration, or drop kick our Bibles, or cherry pick our Bibles, or try to squeeze scriptures into some, into some format, just because we can't figure out every aspect of him. We have finite minds. We are finite, contemplating an infinite God who reveals himself to us, and yet there are sides of God that are beyond our rationality. And so even as believers with the Holy Word, we have to acknowledge these things and wrestle with these things. And again, sit in the middle and be flexible and with the tension of it. So if God says that we're saved, it's because God chose us and he, and it says he predestined it to happen, then we believe that. But we also know that in God's Word, he loves all people and desires all to be saved and that whosoever will may freely come to Jesus and submit their life and receive the gospel. Okay, so let's do fog check. How are we doing in here? We doing okay? Is there fog in the room? There's some humidity in here for sure. 
Was there fog and now there's not fog? And now there's maybe the marine layer? I don't know. We're on the West Coast. Okay, here's where you're doing great. You're doing really great. So here's the plan. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna stop in just a minute. And, uh, you're like, thank God. Amen to that. Stop. And we're going to give the rest of this sermon next week. And I'll give you the fill ins so that you can, you can, you know, be okay. You can relax. And then we'll push ahead a little bit for the rest of chapter one. And then the next week, so in two weeks, we'll deal with the first part of chapter two, which is great. Oh, you're not going to want to miss it. We're going to talk about gladiators in Ephesus. And then the week after, we're going to pause and I'm going to do a whole message on Calvinism and Arminianism. So if you, if you are confused now, then come back in three weeks and you'll be even more confused. Okay. (laughs) That's my promise. (laughs) But we just want to take some time and we want to wrestle with this. We're going to do a little theology together. And we're going to just dig into this. Why? Because the Ephesians passages trigger these conversations and these debates. And we're just going to look at it a little bit deeper. 